Thank you, and uh, you look rested. First day of classes, I'm trusting went well for you. And uh, if you're living in the dorm, it, it can take a, a few days to kind of get ready uh, to sleep at night. Everybody's wound up. I'm, I'm happy to report that uh, Samantha is still talking to me. And uh, I, I was kind of expecting an empty seat today, but uh, she's faithful. It's actually a positive that you did there. So you have anyone, anyone ask you about the story yet? Plenty, okay, okay. If you haven't had a chance, do it this week. Get it over with so that she can rest the rest of the semester. And then uh, th I think Sabrina has uh, something happening sometime. How many days, 95? 105. How many hours, uh, Brother Cooper? <laughs> You'll start getting those questions for sure. Well, um, thank you to Caleb for meeting with me yesterday afternoon, kind of helping me uh, get set up here. I, I understood momentarily that the elementary was going to join us, so I had a, a song for them. How many of you ever heard of uh, the wise old king? Oh, I'm tempted to teach college students this, but I dare not. I'm going to run out of time. So it's where you march them up the hill, you march them down again. When you're up, you're up. When you're down, you're down. When you're halfway up, and you, yeah. So our teachers don't like me doing that in chapel because I wind them up, and then they have to quiet them down. And uh, but it's kind of a fun song. Uh, you look for a way to make a spiritual application out of it. I'm still looking. Uh, but uh, so let me begin by, by going back in time just a little bit. College years are so important. And God wants to use this in your lives. And before you know it, should the Lord tarry, your children will be in college. Your grandchildren will be in college. I told the men last night that uh, I think 98.5% uh, of you will get married. And so um, it's an exciting thing to look forward to. And uh, yet sometimes married students come, as did uh, a young man by the name of Mike Smith. I believe his daughter, Holly Bishop, uh, teaches here in uh, fifth, sixth grade. And I don't remember uh, if, I think she's second born. I don't remember she was alive when they were here. But I, I remember this, 1991, the USSR split up and disseminated and was no more the union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Russia was left, everything else pretty, pretty much spun off. In 1992, eight of us had a chance to fly from um, Anchorage, uh, Alaska to Magadan, Siberia, and our goal was to then fly to Kamchatka Peninsula. There's 13 volcanoes on that little peninsula and uh, try to establish a beachhead for missionaries, which did happen. Uh, we were able to get some in, and that was an exciting trip in October of that year. And I, I believe it was the next spring I was here because my daughter and future son-in-law, kind of like Sabrina and Cooper, were kind of looking ahead, and, and um, uh, uh, they were here as students, and I, I spoke in chapel and mentioned uh, Siberia, not knowing that uh, Mike Smith was sitting there praying, Lord, you've called me to be a missionary, not sure where I'm supposed to go, and it wasn't me, it was just the fact that God uses incidental references and laid it on his heart to be a missionary to Siberia. He ended up going to Siberia. By the way, more recently, I believe um, uh, David Kriegel was challenged by missionary uh, uh, Mueller, Mueller uh, to Mongolia about missions. I don't think he's going to Mongolia, but I think it was challenged. And something he said make, made him think of of Amman, Jordan, which is an exciting uh, possibility there as well. If I have the right person, do I have the right person? Yeah, 
So chapel, God can use it. And uh, Mike Smith um, ended up in Siberia. And then the Russian Orthodox Church put pressure and required them to leave every six months to renew their visa. Well, that's expensive when you're flying out of Siberia. You have to go down to Korea or Japan or at least across the border. And uh, they, they eventually, um, through the, the, the pressure of local government, ended up moving to Estonia, which is where they are today. But I sell that to say, chapel, God can use it. And a little reference, a little comment here, something there. So uh, thank you for your attention. And this morning, I do apologize for going long yesterday. I'm going to really work on it today. And uh, so take your Bible, if you would, and let me have you uh, turn to Psalm chapter 90 and verse 12. I'd like to do three things this morning. They may seem a little bit unrelated, and yet they are connected. And uh, this verse kind of connects it all for us. I do believe that we live in the last days. And uh, it's interesting that scripture in Hebrews 1, 2, while you're turning to Psalm 90, says that God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. And when Jesus came the first time, he's coming again, maybe today, maybe today, and uh, maybe before your first test, um, um, I think many a college student prays to that end. Uh, we used to pray uh, for snow for our college professors because we had a little unwritten rule where I was, if they didn't show up in 10 minutes, she could leave. So we prayed they'd get snowed in, couldn't get there. Uh, the only problem is you've got to make it up. And you studied anyway, you might as well get it over with. Well. God has spoken to us in these uh, last days by his son. Uh, Psalm 90 verse 12 speaks of this. So in light of these things that, uh, that Psalm 90 has been dealing with, the brevity of life, says this, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Life is short at best. Uh, I was chatting with Brother Kelso, and I appreciate your many years here. I forgot to ask you how many, but thank you for your service and, and the seasons of life that God gives us. And sometimes those seasons of life come to a place we shift gears. And um, we don't anticipate all of that, but we trust the Lord for it. Let's begin with prayer. Lord, thank you for this time together for these wonderful college uh, young folks who Lord, you have wonderful plans for their lives, and we're grateful for uh, your, your working in each life. And Lord, it's a, it's a wonderful plan. Yes, there'll be some pressures, some problems. You said, yea, and all that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But Lord, we're grateful for the fact that we can trust you. Help us to teach uh, our, ourselves, in a sense, as you teach us, uh, to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom, and as we, we, we apply our, ourselves to your wisdom, we see what's really important in life and where to invest our minutes, our hours, our days. Thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Time is short. His coming may be even today. So we want to make the most of life. We want to redeem the time. I want to share a couple of verses having to do with the last days because you've heard it probably if you've been in church ever since you were born, I've heard it. We are surely living in the last days and years roll by and you wonder, when will the Lord return? Well, I'll tell you this, it's closer than it's ever been, number one. Number two, the signs of the times. And Mr. Caleb's gonna, gonna put up a, a little quick 10 point signs of the times, and you'll probably not catch it all. I'll leave a copy, I'll try to leave a copy with Mr. Uh, uh, Mitchell, well, yeah, good. I'll try to leave a copy with you so you can catch it. And if you can't find him, uh, Caleb will probably forward it to you. But uh, uh, we live in the last days for sure. Ezekiel, the book I've been preaching through, I Ezekiel 38 says this, as God is speaking, he says, and thou shalt come up against my people Israel. He's talking about Israel's enemies. 
And he says, Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. I will bring uh, thee against my land, that the heathen may know me, when I shall have sanctified in thee, O Gog. The Bible refers to Gog and Magog. We believe that to be Russia. And I know that in your uh, library you have a book by Bob Shelton entitled um, uh, uh, Blueprint, let's see, I wrote it down somewhere. Blueprint and Prophecy. Um, yes, God's Prophetic Blueprint. He's written several books. That's a good one. Uh, Mrs. Armacost checked, you do have it in your library. It's a good one. He has a couple of charts that are in that book that just give a skeletal overview of eschatology. We got permission years ago to uh, uh, do a, a color rendering, laminate those, and, uh, and uh, make them available to our people. And I, ju I just kind of keep one in the front of my Bible because it, it's just a good reminder of events. Let me review ever so briefly. We believe the rapture could be at any time. We believe that there's nothing required yet prophetically uh, that would keep the Lord's return from occurring. Now, shortly after the rapture, we do believe there's some events that start to unfold, and we have a little gap between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation. We don't know how long that is, uh, but however long it is, a couple of things are going to happen. We believe that there's going to be an invasion of Israel from a number of sources, but primarily led by Gog and Magog. And, uh, of course, um, Israel's going to come, come through that because God will intervene and, and, uh, and, uh, and help them. But at the same time, the Antichrist is going to then, at the beginning of the tribulation, be revealed and establish a, 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 a treaty including Israel. And Israel is very cautious and skeptical of of the world today, and especially in the last two weeks of the United States of America and our commitment to them. We have, we have uh, hurt the world immeasurably with our leadership and what they, how they handled the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, it's, just a, it's just a tragedy. Well, uh, the world is going to be in turmoil. The Antichrist is going to sell the world that he can solve the world's problems. He'll bring peace. He'll bring um, uh, rest out of chaos. And they'll sign a treaty, which at the middle point of the tribulation, he's going to break. And um, then um, we have the seals and the trumpets opened up in the first half of the tribulation. And uh, the vials, sometimes called the bowls, in the last half of the tribulation, Battle of Armageddon, uh, the return of Christ, and then a 75-day period where a number of things happened, reestablishment of Israel as a nation, giving leadership to the millennial kingdom reign. At the end of that thousand-year reign comes uh, the loosing of Satan to test those who were born during the tribulation, just as you and I have been tested, coming by the great white throne judgment, followed by the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, that four-square city that is just incredible in dimension, and Revelation 21 and 22 give a lot of information about what eternity future is going to be like uh, in uh, those days following. So all that before us. Well, backing up a little bit, backing up to today, 2021, we're in those last days. The last days beginning, we believe, with the coming of Jesus at his first coming and culminating with the rapture. So we are getting close. What I want to do is just quickly run through, if I could, um, a couple of things that um, uh, are taking place even uh, in the last uh, uh, 100 years. Late 1880s, 1890s, the Zionist movement began. And in its beginning, uh, an aliyah, a return, began. And the Jews started coming back trickling back into uh, the land of Israel. But they, they, there was no structure, there was, there was no peace. Great Britain, Lord Balfour, uh, it's been called the Balfour Declaration, was named as the person instrumental 
in, in, a, in helping lead Britain to establish a protectorate, so to speak. That's my, my, my name. I don't think a word, I don't think it'll sit anywhere. But from 1917 to 1947 48, um, Great Britain uh, set the foundation for what happened in May 14 of 1948, and that was the Declaration of Independence. And the reason Israel did that was Britain pulled out, and, um, and they were left to uh, themselves, and of course God divinely, uh, I believe, helping them, but they were instantly attacked. And, uh, and they, uh, we say they barely survived. Well, barely humanly, but God, I believe, was in it. And one of those signs of the end times, I believe, is their coming back as a nation in 1948. The first time since 586 BC, when the third invasion by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon um, effectively destroyed Jerusalem. Now, 120 some years earlier, the Assyrians had taken out the northern 10 tribes. 722 BC, and uh, they would transplant people and hence the Samaritans. But um, the, 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 um, the forming of Israel as a nation was one of those, those signs. And I, I just give a scripture here, you can study it out on your own. The second is the rise of Russia, and that's Ezekiel 38 and 39. The third one that I believe comes up in scripture, and I don't have time to have you turn to it, but James 5, 1 through 6, speaks of capital and labor conflicts. And what it has to do with is mankind becomes so greedy that they misuse, abuse uh, those who work for them. Now, the United States, with our, our Judeo-Christian foundation, has made a lot of progress versus history. For, for example, in... in um, in uh, the middle 1800s, Great Britain, for example, started passing child labor laws. Can you imagine as a 11, 12 year old going to a factory and working for 12 hours, getting paid very little, what you did get paid, you took home, give your parents so your family can survive, and that was your existence. That, that great uh, uh, industrial age and then as it spilled over into America, th th there were some labor laws and we often say we have too many laws. Uh, well, some are, some are helpful, some are protective. And, uh, and so we've seen this capital and labor conflict. And then the fourth one is the increase in travel and knowledge. I do want you to turn very quickly to, to Daniel chapter 12, if you would. And uh, what, what am I doing again with chapel? I'm just trying to remind us, time is short. Make every minute count because you can't go back and relive any of it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's here and then it's gone. One of the things God gave to Daniel was prophetic information about the future. Chapter 12, he says this in verse four, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the wor words, seal the book, even to the time of the end. And then he says something that's kind of intriguing. Uh, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Drop down to verse, verse, um, verse, um, verse 8. I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? I don't understand. Lord, help me to understand. I want to, I want, I, 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 Daniel had been given this information He's not sure what it means. He's not sure what to do with it. He's just faithful to record it. And then God answers him uh, in verse 9, Go thy ways, Daniel. The words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Another reference to the last days. Go back, if you would, to verse 4. Notice that phrase, many shall run to and fro. Now this, uh, this is fleshed out in the book of Nahum and really has to do with a description of the Assyrians as they come against their enemies, their chariots ran like lightning. And I don't know how time to take us to Nam, but it, it, it talks about their, their, their running through the streets, as, uh, jostling one another as torches and so on. And it, and it makes us kind of think of today at night where, 
where automobiles run through the streets. And if you've ever been in a large city like Mexico City or, or Luna Bottom, Mongolia, it's, it's interesting the traffic jams that are created because they always create two or three more lanes than exist. And they'll use sidewalks, they'll use empty lots, and, 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 and then everybody starts honking at each other. I mean, you know, they're all like this, facing each other and shaking their fist. And, and uh, I was in, in Mongolia one time uh, videotaping this traffic just to go home and show folks how nice we have it. Um, I'm not sure how nice it is in Portland, but um, um, uh, we kind of stay away from downtown anymore. But um, uh, as I was filming this, a taxi came ripping around us and, um, and hit a lady carrying a baby. And I, I'm, I'm right, right there, right, right in front of us. I, I mean, just, it, the, the traffic's just incredible. Well, um, I think there's a, a second application of this verse from Daniel that really has to do with knowledge shall be increased because I do think the primary context had to do with uh, the Assyrians. But what knowledge has increased? We know an awful lot more than we did 100 years ago about the signs of the end times. Just the resurgence of Israel as a nation. Huge. Key. And then in 1967, that uh, six, seven day war where they regained the Golan Heights. 1973, when they regained control of the Temple Mount. And then the one-eyed uh, military, Moshe Dayan, gave it back, so to speak. And uh, we're at the mercy of, uh, of uh, uh, the, the Palestinians when we try to get up on the Temple Mount. But the knowledge that, that increased, and we see it, they say, they say knowledge is doubling about once every 13 months. Just the body of knowledge. It's amazing how, uh, how you want to know something. You ask Suri, and she'll come up with usually an answer. Sometimes she says to me, I don't understand you, um, um, or some such thing. And I'll try to talk to her. She never talks back. But um, knowledge is at your fingertips. It's amazing. Well, there's another sign of the time, and that is um, not only the, the uh, capital and labor conflicts, the increase in knowledge and travel, but listen to uh, 1 Timothy 4 when it speaks of apostasy. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. And here's what they do, giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Second Timothy four goes on to say, verse three, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, they shall t turn away their ears from the truth. If you, if you do a door knocking regularly, you find you get a number of responses from those that are interested to those who, no, I'm good. I don't know how many times I've heard that. Um, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was knocking doors, and about five seconds later, I heard on the other side of the door a <laughs> guy knocked back at me. <laughs> I thought, well, this will be interesting. And uh, he opened the door, and he was an older gentleman. Had no interest. I think he just was trying to have some fun with whoever's down the side of the door. But um, uh, they don't want to hear. They have ears, uh, itching ears. And then 2 Timothy uh, 3.13 says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. The next one is, is Galatians uh, 5, where occultism is mentioned, and just the word witchcraft. Oh, it abounds all about us. And what an increase there is in that. 2 Timothy 3 goes on and speaks of, in verse uh, uh, 3, verse 1 says, Know this also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. And there's a whole list here. And there's a, an additional list um, we don't have time to cover. But let me just cover this matter of scoffers. It's akin to boasters, the proud the, the, the prideful, the despisers of those that are good. Second Peter 3.3 3 helps us to understand, as does Paul in writing to Timothy, the same thing. He says, knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers 
walking after their own lusts. And then 2 Peter 3 speaks of the moral breakdown, and that's all about us. In fact, verse uh, 3 of chapter 3 says, knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. The moral breakdown of society. People do things that it was, a, it was a shame to even speak of 50 years ago. And the, the world is just open about it. And uh, I'm not even going to give you an example because you, you know what they are. The moral breakdown is just running rampant all about us. And then the last two things I do not have time to develop either. But the one world church mentioned Revelation 17. Now, that isn't here yet, but it's working toward it. Uh, that's going to come during the tribulation era, Revelation 17. And then the one world government. Uh, Daniel was given a, a vision of the, the, uh, the image. And the, the major empires of the world are given from head, beginning with Babylon, all the way down to the two-pronged eastern-western uh, division of the Roman Empire. What's at the bottom of the image? You all have them. Ten toes. Speaking of a revived Roman Empire coming up here, and we see that starting to form. We see, even in recent years, our president's trying to get a world coalition to deal with, ha with what happened in Iraq, to, uh, to try to deal with the situation in Afghanistan. And it's going to get even more prolonged. If you go to Revelation chapter 13, just listen as I read, there's coming a time when the Antichrist and his uh, accomplice will require for people who want to buy or sell to have a mark. Listen to this. And I, 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 I don't think we're there yet. I don't think that's been revealed yet. But I think it's starting to get set up for that. Listen. He, the Antichrist, caused both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. That's one of the reasons why we would discourage tattoos. It's just, a, it's just getting a, a mindset toward, toward uh, that kind of thing. And, and who knows exactly how it's going to be. They'll say, well, it's invisible, and you won't know it's there, and the chip will be so small. And, and uh, God outlines it there. You say, well, if we're raptured, why do we need to know this? Well, I, I, I met a missionary in Israel some years ago, and he had a burden to get a copy of the Bible to every Knesset member. So he mailed a Bible to every Knesset member, and then he mailed a Bible to every rabbi, and then he started mailing Bibles to every teacher, and he caught the attention of the Israelis and um, uh, they don't have the same freedom of religion uh, we do. They have a law there that you cannot witness, they call it proselytizing, uh, to anyone 18 years old of age or younger. And he had to leave the country for a time because he had a number of young kids and there was danger of them taking his kids away. And he's back now. But he said this, he said, um, there's something about the Bible, even though the Orthodox Jews don't accept the New Testament because it has the Old Testament with it, they will not destroy a Bible. There could be a rare exception, but generally they will not destroy a Bible. And uh, they'll, they'll, they'll tuck it away, put it somewhere. But it's his thought, and I, I'm intrigued by it, that during the tribulation period, uh, they may go and find that Bible and start to study, because we know, I don't think those that have heard prior to the rapture, but those uh, during the tribulation, uh, there'll be many saved as the 144,000 go out throughout all the, all, all the world, 12,000 from each tribe. And it's not the Jehovah's Witnesses either. So uh, I, I, I'm intrigued by his thought about that. So God wants us to kind of be aware, thinking ahead, alert, and reminded, hey, our time is short, and we need to make every minute count. Well, let me go uh, onward then in, in helping us to um, realize that 
in light of the shortness of time, there are some other signs of, uh, that are about us. And one is the preparation of the building of the third temple. We believe that third temple, and you say third temple, bear with me on the numberings. Solomon was number one uh, when the uh, deportations took place, and there were three, and then three returns. On the return, Zerubbabel came back, laid the foundation, started to rebuild the temple. Uh, Ezra came back, further built on the temple. Nehemiah came back, built the walls and the gates. That is the second temple. Now the second temple then uh, was not as glorious as the first, but it endured up until the time of Herod the Great. He uh, greatly expanded the, the platform. And by the way, it's amazing what he did. I was down in the lower level along the western wall and there is a foundation stone that is estimated to weigh 613 tons. By the way, there's a little fissure in it. It's like 40 feet long. And uh, they're only guessing at the weight. You're not going to get it on any scales. So it's, it's holding the rest of the Temple Mount up. But due to the density of the rock and the ways of, of anticipating, a ton is 2,000 pounds. You, you can imagine how heavy this thing is. How did they move it? It's interesting. There's a little fissure in that rock. And as I was leaving that underground area, chatted with another pastor I never met, and he said, he said, I wonder if it could be that that fissure occurred during the earthquake when Jesus was on the cross. Boy, what hair I have tried to stand up. I mean, it, it, I mean, chills go up and down your spine to think, because we know some amazing things happened during those three hours. Graves were open. People were, saints were resurrected, went into the city. I mean, all kinds of things took place there. Well, we still call that the second temple. The third temple is going to be rebuilt and we believe that's going to happen shortly after the rapture, but before too much into the beginning of the tribulation period. You say, how would they build that so quickly? Look at how fast skyscrapers go up today. The other thing is, there is an organization called the Temple Institute. Caleb's going to get that queued up for me. I want to show you a two-minute clip of something that they are doing. I went to the Temple Institute. They have a an unbelievable showroom where they are showing some of the articles they've already built for the third temple. Table of showbread, menorah. They've got over 70 things. The Harari family are, are making the harps and the story just goes on and on. But one of the things the Temple Institute is doing, and these are Orthodox Jews, they are raising red heifers because Numbers speaks of the red heifer without spot, without blemish, and the red heifer is sacrificed and the ashes are used as a part of the cleansing for the ceremonial um, worship in the temple, which is going to happen again in the third temple. By the way, there's a fourth temple coming, and that's the Millennial Kingdom Temple. God will make that uh, himself, and it'll be, it'll be huge. Well, back to the Temple Institute, they are right now, and have been for some years, raising red heifers. And I have a two-minute clip where they interview, and the English is pretty good, of, a, of one of the Temple Institute people raising the red heifer to review. What are you going to see? The red heifer, they're going to use it in the sacrifice. So there's got to be a red heifer, and typically it would be of an age between two and three years old. So uh, you'll see a couple of red heifers. He'll talk about it. But I've just given you the backstory to it in a sense that, that uh, they're looking for one without blemish. And uh, this video clip, you, you, can, you can go to Temple Institute YouTube and look for the March 11, 2021. And that's what's being given here. And, uh, and he will say, these are two red heifers. But he says, they each have two white hairs that disqualifies them to be without spot and without blemish because they go to numbers. They understand two white hairs. I'm thinking, man, go paint that thing. Uh, 
uh, uh, but uh, that, that would not be kosher, uh, so you uh, can't paint them. But he said, maybe they'll grow out of it. Well, I've done that. I've grown out of my hair. Maybe they'll grow out of, maybe they'll grow out of uh, those two white hairs. My point is, they're getting ready. Uh, that's just exciting to me. Uh, because this is just one of many things that are being prepared for uh, the uh, sacrificial worship in the third temple. And that's coming soon. Let's conclude. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Lord, thank you for...